good with yeah, the take no, today, Mike. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We're now streaming? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Komal Mittal, and I'm a pop youth mentor at the pop movement. Today, I'll be moderating this session on visionary leadership with my colleague, Shelly Kadia, who is a mentor motivator at the pop movement. The pop family welcomes you all to the session on visionary leadership. We are very excited to have you here. Thank you very much for joining us today. Before we start, I would like to mention a series of indications. We would first like to request you to turn off, turn off your microphone to avoid any background noise. If you have any questions, you can ask them through the Zoom chat. Our facilitators will help us coordinate with your queries. We would also like to share our social media handles to keep you informed about our future activities. Please see the chat box for our social media handles. If you are... Um, if you're sharing the content from the festival, we would appreciate if you use our hashtags and tag us. You can also sign up for the pop to join the pop movement. The link is mentioned below in the chat. We are also organizing some special workshops with our partners. We would appreciate if you would like to join that also. Moving on, this is a very special session on visionary leadership. A conversation will be held between his Excellency Mike Rand, long-standing Premier of South Australia, as he discusses and explores visionary leadership in achieving Agenda 2030 in the light of COVID-19, and Ms. Pita Milan, a global entrepreneur and advocate for, for action on sustainability, will underscore the importance of visionary female leadership. A very warm welcome to you, sir and ma'am. Before proceeding for the session, now I invite my co-moderator, Shelly Kadia, to grieve to give a brief context. Over to you, Shelly. Thank you, Komal, and welcome everyone. Before I hand over the floor to our very distinguished uh, speakers, I would like to frame the topic a little more. Visionary leadership implies having a clear idea of how the future should look like and accordingly set out accurate uh, and concrete steps to bring the vision to life. Another term which needs further <clears throat> explanation is transcendence. Transcendental leaders and not only think about institution, self and organizational goals, but also about societal implications. To respond to climate change and address issues related to planetary health and equity, both intergenerational and intragenerational, we need transcendental leaderships. The scale and scope of addressing climate change is both large and complex. In this background, transcendental visionary leaders have to consider planetary scales and have to have a vision which needs to reflect boldness to challenge existing state market institutions and prevailing development paradigms. For this session, we have two very eminent speakers from whom we all look forward to learn. Along with their interventions, the moderators would like to request each esteemed speaker to address two broad questions. How do leaders of tomorrow engage better with the world to challenge existing and dominating paradigms of state market institutions and development models? What advice would you give to the aspiring young transcendental visionary leaders on climate change? Apart from this, of course, our esteemed speakers will also touch on issues related to gender and female leadership. I would now like to invite our first speaker, His Excellency, Mr. Mike Ran. His Excellency has served as the Premier of South Australia, a Minister of Sustainability and Climate Change, and the National President of the Australian Labour Party. Excellency, Mr. Mike Ran. We look forward to listening and learning from you on transcendental visionary leadership. Over to you, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. And it's good to be back with you and Ash and also with my other uh, friend and lead speaker, Peter, who is uh, based in Portugal at the moment, but 
we were all last time together in Durango, Mexico, which I have to say was one of the highlights of a very difficult year. So it's great to be back with you. And uh, as many people know, as a good friend of Ash's uh, late father. And so I'm so pleased with what he's doing and what you're all doing to further the, 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 further the action that, that Dr. Pachuri was very much a visionary leadership. I guess the first thing I want to say is just to deal with a few words, and that is that when it comes to leadership, we, the word we, is much better than me or I. And, you know, what visionary leaders listen. Uh, anyone who thinks that they have all of the answers, no matter how visionary, is basically wrong, will fail, isn't a real leader, and isn't authentic. Now, in politics, as well as most other things, uh, those with leadership ambitions, in my experience, are generally divided between those who want to be, they want titles, they want uh, honours, they want powerful positions, or those who want to do. And those who want to do are the end, end up being those who become visionary leaders. Now, everyone will tell young people that commitment is the key to success. And that's partly true. But also there are other issues such as perseverance. You know, it's really important, whatever level it is, whether it's at the local village level, in a community, in a region, a town, a city, a province, a state or a nation, to actually persevere. Because I, I've certainly found and I know other leaders who've got to senior positions, that perseverance is often very much, along with commitment, the key to success. And finally, there's resilience. And resilience means that in any great cause, there are going to be setbacks, personal setbacks, professional setbacks, or setbacks in terms of trying to achieve the aims of an organisation. Being resilient along with that commitment and perseverance, but adding in resilience means that when you get knocked down, that you can stand up again and keep uh, walking forward to achieve your aims. You know, and so I'm trying to think today and, and talking with Peter about people who I know right now who are younger than old timers like me, who are the visionary leaders of the future and why. And one of them is my friend Jacinda Ardern, who is the Prime Minister of New Zealand. She became Prime Minister three years ago, almost exactly three years ago, in an election which was essentially, um, there was no clear winner. And so she had to put together a coalition of people, including, she's the leader of the Labour Party, which is the equivalent of the Democratic Party in, in the United States. Um, but she had to put together a coalition in order to become prime minister and to form a government. And she formed it with other political parties. On her left, there was the Green Party who came in and supported her. But on her right, there was another party to, to the right of the Labour Party, but saw her as something different. And I guess what happened out of that is that that showed that she had the ability to listen, to achieve consensus, to actually bring people together with sometimes disparate views, but with a common vision about where their country, New Zealand, was heading. She, of course, had to confront three huge crises. Uh, as a, a brand new young leader, age 37, who, by the way, um, uh, had a baby um, just, you know, in her first year as being prime minister. And so what those crises were that a year ago, there was a terrible massacre of Muslim people in a mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand. The massacre by a lone gunman uh, with a machine gun killed 51 people and injured many more. What Jacinda did is once again show empathy with people. She flew to Christchurch. She met with those who were injured. She met with the relatives, the 
wives, husbands, parents, um, kids of those who had been who had died, and she wore a hijab. She she wore her hijab as way of showing respect to the Muslim community of New Zealand, an innocent community that had seen in two mosques in Christchurch this terrible massacre take place. By doing that and by embracing everybody one by one, there was a vision of a leader who was there to heal, not divide. I mean, if you could ever imagine a more, a more different leader to Donald Trump in America, who seeks political advantage um, by dividing people, by making sure that some people are seen as targets for others, blaming others for his mistakes. So what Jacinda did is immediately empathize, identify. And we have seen that the, the, the other, we saw a response to that was that the ruler of the United Arab Emirates projected a vision of her, the New Zealand prime minister in a hijab on the world's tallest building, her embracing um, one of the family members of those who were killed on behalf of 1.5 million Muslims in the world, that this was a kind of leadership that was quite different. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine a Donald Trump doing that? Could the people in, in this audience who come from many other countries imagine their leaders doing that? She was then, of course, confronted by a second crisis. That crisis was a terrible volcanic explosion um, where, where a whole lot of tourists were visiting this volcano that has been sort of bubbling for thousands of years. But while the tourists were there, the volcano erupted and killed lots and lots of people and horrifically injured others. And she went there and spent time one by one at the bedsides of those who were seriously injured and also with their families. And of course, the final crisis was COVID. And so different, again, to the United States. New Zealand has the best record in the world in handling COVID because she very calmly but decisively closed the borders to all aircraft. She, and then she went on television often every night um, with using, like we are, but the most of New Zealand connected in, taking questions from people on online and carefully, calmly explained how New Zealand was going to deal, five million people with this crisis, how it was going to deal with it, what each step would be taken, what would happen if certain things altered course. She treated New Zealand like a team. Some said she treated them like she was the coach of New Zealand's famous rugby team about explaining what they would all do together. And, that, and so the sense of not I'm in charge, you will do this. It was a sense of we, us, not me or I. And so, you know, I, I will open this up for, for Peter first and then the discussion. But today in New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern has announced a state of climate emergency. She told the parliament a few hours ago that New Zealand was now essentially in a state of emergency about the world climate. And that so she has declared today that all of the public sector, all of government will be carbon neutral by 2025. That is an incredibly hard thing to do. This follows announcements of setting up a climate commission that New Zealand will be totally renewable by 2030 and not by 2050, but by 2030, matching, I should say, um, South Australia's commitment, my own state's uh, commitment. And very few places in the world uh, have got such of a commitment. So in South Australia, we had zero renewable energy and we will be have 100% by 2030 as well. But I think that the, my point about her is that she is someone who, that, uh, when they asked, and we all see in all of our different countries how incredibly divided people are on so many issues. 
But here we had a prime minister who essentially, when she, uh, at the end of the, of the COVID crisis, they did an opinion poll of New Zealanders and 92% approved of her performance. But once again, it comes back to uh, what, you know, to, to listening to people, not just insisting, but listening. In my state, we had a, uh, when we, when I was elected in 2002, we had a serious economic problem. We went out to the people in 150 meetings around the state over some time, but also in a range of other ways. And we asked people, how would you like your state to be 10 years from now? And what would you like me as the new premier to concentrate on. It was out of that that we came up with a 10-year plan, which included all the things that we've done on renewable energy and a whole range of other things. It was by listening to the people, it's their state, it's their nation, asking them what they want, and then through quiet leadership, not noisy leadership, through quiet leadership, setting targets to achieve. The one thing I will say, though, is it's whenever we have people setting targets for the future, it's really important to show the steps on the way. It's very easy for anyone to say, we will be zero uh, carbons, uh, net zero by 2050, but, and then, but they know that they won't be around in five years or 10 years. They'll be left for someone else to do the work. Always say, and my plea to everyone, whatever country it, you're in, if your politicians make grand announcements about targets for the future, ask them what the target is for two years' time, five years' time, and 10 years' time, because they have to be held accountable to that. I'm now going to stop talking for a while, hand over to my good friend uh, Peter, who seems to be in a very Christmassy mood over there in Portugal, sunny Portugal, and uh, I'll hand over to her, but looking forward to questions and dialogue with you. Thanks, Mike. I'm going to bring you in, so I'm not leaving you hanging out there while I talk. So I can notice that uh, we have quite a lot of diversity in our uh, audience. It might not seem that Mike and I are a very diverse panel because we're two white Aussies, but uh, we're taking this from the perspective of gender, which I think is important. And Mike has referred to a very, very powerful and effective female leader. And I'm interested in and supporting you guys. Like, what does that take to get there? Well, I'm not going to compare myself anywhere near Jacinda, but I've been on a journey as a female leader myself. And one, you know, with many colleagues that I've shared where there's similar stories. Um, so I've been quite public about, you know, my, my journey and it's on YouTube. And um, as a survivor of child abuse, when you're kind of growing up and you're kind of protecting yourself all the time you, you grow up with these defense mechanisms and not everybody has that type of experience but we all have our natural defense mechanisms and how that impacted me as a female leader in my early career was I was getting feedback from staff and from people going you're so cold you don't care about anyone you're just a bitch and these types of things and it it was horrific for me because I felt so misunderstood I was like no I feel so much inside. That's not me. I'm not cold. But I really had to take a hard look at myself. And what I saw that I'd done was I had masculinized myself. I'd fallen into the trap of feeling that to become a leader and to have uh, uh, influence and to make change, which was all very well intended, I had to compete with the men because we were so underrepresented. So it led me on a journey to explore a bit more of my own vulnerability. And that led to different types of experiences. And I had to ask myself, what is leadership for me about authentically? Like, who am I? What am I bringing to this, uh, to this planet while I'm here? And what I discovered was, you know, I was always one of these young kids where people would always say to me, oh, don't overcomplicate things. You know, you're making things more complex than they need to. But what I found out was that was actually a gift because I'm not afraid to stand in complexity. And when you're looking at working on particular challenging topics like uh, some of the scenarios Mike's just presented that Jacinda had to deal with or climate change or any, they're complex in nature. Look at how many people they impact, 
how many different locations they impact. And so I started to take a really kind of deep look at what do we need to do to actually change a system? And what I found was in that depth, like if you're going to go deep to solve a problem, which you need to if it's highly complex and it's global in nature, then in the nature of that work, you start to form deep bonds with people, deep connections, because they're also looking deep and they're also trying to solve the same problems. But part of the challenge of that when you're a female leader is that because so much of the female stereotypes is objectification of women or sexualization of women, particularly in male-female roles, when you have deep connections with people at work, it really often got misunderstood for an intimacy that would get misconstrued for romantic in nature. And I had this one experience and Mike, I haven't been in Australia for a while, so I'm going to try my best Oka Aussie accent. You might need to correct me if it's not right. But I was presenting to a board of managing directors for a mining services company. And I'd been standing up there. And by the way, I've got permission from Ash prior to sharing this story to share it. <laughs> I got clearance. So standing up in front of the board, I'm presenting this corporate roadmap. About 30 minutes in, the managing director looks at me and goes, Sorry, Peter, haven't been able to hear anything you've been saying because I can't stop staring at your tits. Oh and God. I was like, <laughs> so Mike's reaction is what most men do when they hear that story. But most women's reaction are like, really, you should hear what happened to me. And then there's another story of a similar kind. And we face those kinds of experiences. And I have had other types of experiences where I was, um, fortunate enough to meet the crown prince of a name, a country I won't name, but we were working on uh, uh, sim uh, sh shared topics because, uh, interestingly, Mike sharing about the uh, the Muslim attack in in New Zealand. I'm actually on the leadership in counter counterterrorism alumni association network, which is part of NATO Five Eyes. And what we f discovered after Jacinda's uh, response to that was that there were there was only one counterattack that happened in the world. And that was unheard of. Normally there's counterattacks that happen everywhere, but she handled it so beautifully that it didn't have this mass ripple effect of mass violence that other attacks had had. Um, and so I met this Crown Prince and we were working in this area and we, we got along really well. And so he was like, oh, I'm coming to Portugal. I was like, great, I live there, like come and I'll show you around and we can talk. And, and then there was this moment of awkwardness and he was like, hesitating he was like oh yeah okay I'll catch you later and then he turned to his male colleagues some of which he'd just met he's like okay guys let's go for a drink and then of course he never contacted me so there's this like pushing away because there's this awkwardness in the connection I'm not quite sure how to how to make sense of it and for me sometimes in my early stages of careers I started exploring this intimacy in work depth of work type thing, I got confused and I, make mis I made mistakes, right? So, but it led me down a track of understanding what I was actually about. And interestingly, when I share that story about, you know, the mining services guys, I actually had one of my uh, employees equate that to, oh yeah, but men get stereotyped all the time. I was in an office once and I was the only guy and a woman said to me, you're the only strong man here. Could you move this box? And I was like, they're not really comparable <laughs> stereotypes because one renders a person voiceless. One renders someone as objectified, whereas a lot of the male stereotypes are there to empower, right? Empower men, like strong, provider, these types of things. There is some toxicity that's going on in masculinity. And Obama, I don't know if you saw it, President Obama, former President Obama gave a wonderful kind of, discussion to the Guardian about this, about the old model of what does masculinity mean? And he was talking about things like Mike was sharing about compassion, empathy, a sense of responsibility, these types of things. Um, and so, you know, as women try to navigate this world, and it does happen, especially if you're doing deep work, and, and I'm very open now about my thing is intimacy. I want deep connections with people. I want to do deep work that impacts system-wide change. We can't faff about on the surface if we're going to get meaningful things done. 
And so what I did was I started to employ strategies. If I have a really good friend who's male, you know, I want to kind of like meet his wife and go out for dinner with his wife and make sure that it's very, very clear that I really deeply am connected to this person, but I'm connected to him in the context of his life and the work that he's doing. And, and that's where the connection lies. Uh, and, and so then there's a permission to have those types of uh, relationships with very clear boundaries. Um, but one of the things that women make the mistake of doing is they will either start invalidating or trying to disempower men, which is a mistake because men are important and they have a very important energy to contribute to the healing of the world. And uh, if we're doing that, then we are being patriarchal as well. And I just want to create a distinction because a lot of people confuse masculinity with patriarchy. They're different. Patriarchy is power by taking power away from something else. That's not masculinity. That's just patriarchy. And women can behave in patriarchal ways as much as men. Hence my abusive mother. She was very patriarchal. She was about getting power over something by taking power away. It happens. So if we do that, if we start invalidating the masculine voice, then we're being the same as the men who are stuck in patriarchy. That's not adding any value. If we start behaving like what we think we should behave like to compete with men, then we're not bringing our natural diversity to the table. If you have six people on your board and three women and three are men, but the three women are behaving like men, where's your diversity there? It's not contributing that uniqueness. And then lastly, women sometimes make the mistake of thinking about how they think they should be to keep others happy or meet their expectations. And I think Mike has some good examples to share there, which I'll flip to him in a minute, uh, based on his experience in, in parliament in, in Australia. And we need to carve away at those three things and say, who as a human being am I really about and what is there for me to express and you know some things are superficial like I like having pink hair and sparkly nails and I always stand out in the crowd because of that <laughs> in weird places but it, that's authentic for me so I just like being that but I also like being a complicated thinker and I like having deep and profound relationships and I like having interesting conversations. I'm rubbish at small talk, totally rubbish. Uh, I like to really get into it with people. And some people find that threatening. Some people find that engaging. But there's kind of like no gray with me, right? Like no middle ground. It's either you love me or you hate me and run a mile. And that's okay. I've come to terms with that. So, but I'm figuring out how to be that truest expression of myself. And I think that when we look at Jacinda, consistently through her prime ministership there has been that level of integrity about who she is and what she is bringing to the table and I think that that's the most powerful thing for a woman to look at and there will be challenges as a woman along the way because there's no agreement for us yet you know we represent six percent of the board tape boardroom tables we access 2% of the world's venture capital funding. There's a long way to go. And, and denying that the gender gap is there doesn't help. It's just like denying that systemic racism is there because we want to get to a place where there's equality quickly. No, you've got to acknowledge what's there first and be able to collaborate across all your stakeholders. And so getting parity here is an equal effort between men and women because men need to call out the men who are still objectifying. And this is not just assholes doing this, by the way, because it's unconscious sometimes. And I'm going to share a story about my very loving and loyal husband, and he won't mind me calling him out on this because it's for the purposes of learning. <laughs> but he was on a call with a woman who was from an institute and they, he wanted to meet with her because he saw that there were some synergies about what we could do with our company and with their institute. But he put into the email, oh, you have to meet my amazing wife. She's like this. She's like this and da, da, da. And he turned to me after he wrote the email. He said, I did this because I didn't want her to think it was like a date. And I went, 
she doesn't think it's the date. You're the one who just sexualized this. And it was unconscious for him. He was like trying to protect himself because he was married and he didn't want anyone getting any wrong ideas. Um, but it's just the way he automatically conceptualized what does a man going up with a woman for lunch look like, feel like. <laughs> and it was automatic. It wasn't even conscious. So we have these unconscious biases and that our responsibility is to call ourselves on those biases to not be uh, so closed as to say uh, or deny that those things exist in us because the minute we call them out, we get some freedom. And one of the interesting things about regenerative approaches to solving problems, whether they be climate change or social issues or whatever, is that the model always starts from the self. It starts with self first. How effectively can we put ourselves into other people's shoes or see through different lenses? And then it goes, and these are three levels of work that have to happen simultaneously. Then the third level is actually looking at community and growing the capability of communities and teams. And then the third level, the third line of work is improving the health and the value of a whole system. So you need to be busy at this work together. So that's why when you're looking at solving large scale social issues, you can't just put your brain out there into the external world and say, how am I going to solve that? Because you have to start here first because we are part of the natural living system. We are part of nature. We are part of the ecosystem. So we have to start really locally first, which is ourselves as local as you can get, and then start engaging your stakeholders from that point out through the complexity of the system so that you can start to figure out how to solve those problems. And it's a move away from the Cartesian idea, if you've ever studied philosophy of Descartes or um, any of those guys, where it's really, really me mechanistic approach to problem solving, where that thing sits over there and then we have to solve it. Or that woman sits over there and she's a reflection of our animal passions and we have to suppress it and tame it. You know, all of these things were kind of like disconnected uh, philosophies from the 1700s, but they shaped our modern thought on how we solve problems, how we build economies, how we relate in terms of our relationship to nature, which has led to this like destructive kind of disconnected relationship and that's the thing that we have to heal and that's the paradigm that we have to shift and that's got to start with us as leaders first so maybe Mike because we were talking the other day you were sharing about some interesting experiences you had where you saw you know people who had been at the effect of these types of discrimination in really powerful roles and also women who kind of played to what they thought was popular opinion and where that didn't work and finding the authentic self? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, just to take up your point, uh, one of the things that I first did when I first got elected was to insist that we had a new rule that all government boards and committees um, and all of the agencies that had, you know, people appointed to the, the, the governing um, bodies had to be 50% women. Now, so that would take a while because people have been appointed for five years to things or whatever, but we knew that was the aim. And we, we pretty much got there, but it was the reaction at the start, not from any of my political colleagues, but from the people in the government departments was, oh, it just can't be done because, I mean, how can we have 50% women when we're dealing with mining or we're dealing with economic development or engineering? Or So there was this automatic assumption. I mean, there's lots and lots of women involved in, in mining technologies or in science. Or there was even one saying it was the martial arts committee of this, you know, because every sporting body has uh, has committees and boards and so eventually they were reluctant and in the end every single member of that board was a woman and so we just tried to send because there were people who would performed in olympics and and so on so people have these inbuilt assumptions that there are sort of women's areas of government health and education 
welfare, the nurturing, caring side. Oh, yes, quite happy to have 50% boards there, but somehow there was a whole slice of government which was seen as boys' work. So that you know, took a while to change because also under statutes, under legislation, different organisations have a right to appoint people to boards, the medical, the Australian Medical Association or whatever organisation, unions and so on. So we could have 50% from the ones that we appointed ourselves, but we then said to people, rather than you choose, because you're still keeping to choose the guys, we want you to put forward you know, two names, a male and a female, and that way we could sort of balance, or it might be three names, but it had to be that they couldn't be three, three men. So we had to get through this ridiculous notion that there were some areas where men had to be better. Um, your point about people playing different roles, Margaret Thatcher, when she was Prime Minister of Great Britain, for years as Prime Minister would not have any women in her cabinet. So she was always pictured at the centre in her bright blue suit, surrounded by men. And, uh, and they were all some men of a, of a cert certain age. And so, you know, you had, so she was really playing the male game. She was going to be the tough one. She wasn't going to consult. She was famous for not consulting. She was going to tell people. But then your other point, and is that I've also seen, and I think politics has been very difficult around the world for women. And hopefully it's getting better and better as more women. I mean, Jacinda is the third woman prime minister of New Zealand. And, I, and one of a very close friend was her predecessor a few years back, Helen Clark, who then went on to be head of the United Nations Development Programme um, and was the, had that job for 10 years. So, so there, was, there were pathfinders. But I've also seen women fall into the trap of playing the male game or, or the media game of, you know, of, of, of saying basically the media will say, we'd like you in a fashion shoot. And so you end up getting this dialogue where women are described by the color of their hair. No one ever, well, these days it would be white, but, uh, or before that gray, but no one ever said that brunette Mike ran. But women <laughs> described as blondes or brunettes the blonde prime minister or blonde minister, or they refer to their clothing, they refer to their dress, they refer to their figures, they refer to their weight, they refer to their makeup, their lipstick, all of these things that doesn't happen to us guys in our dark suits. So there's all of these things that I have to, do I look good enough? Um, do I play their game? Do I go, do a fashion shoot? And then do, when they ask me about my private life, do they tell them? And then it becomes about their love life and, and what have you. So, and then of course they're raised up to like saints and then brought down crashing. Mm. So I think you've got those two models that you just discussed. And then the third model, which is essentially the Jacinda model. And indeed it was the Helen Clark model. And indeed, it was the Julia Gillard model in Australia when she was the first female prime minister, is to be authentic, to be yourself. Don't play anyone's game. Just actually be yourself, mean what you say, say what you mean. I mean, the great thing about Jacinda is that what you see on television or in parliament is exactly the same as the person of the person that you know and other people who know even better so there's no difference between the two and I think that increasingly people are actually saying we want leaders who are real and authentic and that we can relate to that doesn't mean to say it's not going to be hard but I've seen so many women trying to play the media's game because they think that it will make them popular and will think that it will help them achieve the things that they want, including lots of things for the community, but end up kind of getting seriously burned in the process. I mean, Julia Gillard, who was Prime Minister from 2010 to 2013 in Australia, 
had to put up with the worst media I've ever seen, aimed at a you know, talkback host and media trying to trivialize it, attacking her about her figure, um, attacking her about her clothes, uh, attacking her about her hair, her voice, all of these things, even when her lovely father, and I knew him, not well, but I met him a couple of times, when he died, the talkback host said he probably died of shame because of his daughter. I mean, they, do, they did things to Julia Gillard publicly that they would never, ever do to a, to, a, to a guy. And to her great credit, with great dignity, she called them out. She called out the sexism that was occurring in the parliament. Where they and, and demonstrations which had things like ditch the witch or ditch the bitch and things like this, they didn't do that to, to, to the guys. So I think that my message to young people is, yes, be committed. Think about how you're going to change things for the better for others. Have perseverance. Be resilient because you're going to have to put up with a whole lot of attacks from people. If you want to change things, there's always resistance. But by the same token, be authentic and just keep going because, you know, my, my view is if you keep your eye on the prize, which is to really make a difference for the world, you'll be successful. Mm. And what I can just add to that is what I've learned on my journey too, because it can be pretty lonely as a woman being a leader, given how underrepresented we are and how uh, these uh, constructs, these social constructs are, th are there to kind of like set us back. But the more you can find that authentic expression of yourself, the more you just naturally find people who are also authentic and then eventually you find your tribe, you know. And so that loneliness or that authenticity leads you to find powerful connections of like-minded people where you feel at home and you feel like you have that support. All of my best friends, they don't live where I live. They work where I work. And that's all over the world. So the people that I consider my closest friends are scattered all over the planet, but I feel powerfully connected to them. I know they have my back. I know that I have theirs and that I can be myself. And that's the most important, powerful thing that you need as you're developing yourself as a leader is that safe place that you can count on. And you develop that the more authentic, the more real you get with yourself. So are there any questions? Because I know that we have, I don't know, uh, not that long left. Yeah. Sorry, Peter. Yeah, you know, I mean, you're just, 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 uh, you went ahead in the conversation and I couldn't introduce you. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but the, the intention was like also to introduce you. So, yes, uh, you know, just for the benefit of um, our participants, um, uh, you know, Peter Milan is an entrepreneur and a media, media professional who is the founder and CEO of Transcendent Media Capital, uh, director and co-founder of JDLI Technologies and is also associated with the World Academy of Arts and Science. And I'm also an international advisory board member of the World Sustainable Development Forum, yes. which is and, <laughs> yes. the Absolutely. sister organization of the pop movement. Yay. Absolutely. <laughs> and so is uh, His Excellency Mike Rand. He's also a patron. And so it's wonderful to have, you know, two outstanding uh, leaders uh, to have given this um, their perspective. So uh, thank you so much. And I think like the next session is the youth dialogue session. And we'll also be taking questions from the chat box. And for moderating this, I will invite my co-moderator, Komal. And uh, Komal, over to you. Thank you, Shady. Thank you so much. So uh, moving on, we, we have uh, very determined, very enthusiastic uh, young leaders from all over the world with us. Will be taking over the session. Uh, will taking over this session of dialogue with us, and they'll have few questions. Before moving on, uh, Ayatula was not able to. Uh, she was not able to join us, so we have received a question from her side. So we'll start with that, and then uh, we'll take it forward. So uh, the question is: Media can play critical role in preparing qualified future leader. 
do you think that what media presenting to our youth is enough to motivate them and and helping them be active citizens the media yeah so peter you why don't you start and i'll finish okay okay tag team cool. um yeah so i think that the um well i think that something that's missing that we all have a civic responsibility to develop in ourselves is news media literacy because there is a lot that is presented that's questionable in terms of its factual accuracy and is really driving uh, a lot of um, kind of agendas. And Oxford University actually recently came out with a study that looked at levels of collusion within media. And the majority of mainstream media was found to be quite collusive, uh, even though not directly controlling, like you might say in some countries like uh, North Korea, uh, where the, the government controls what's put out onto the media is directly controlling. But the next level down is collusive. So there are um, media moguls who own the news stations who have a certain political agenda and support certain parties. Um, and that happens in Western, Eastern, African countries all over, right? So the important thing for us is to develop independence around our ability to ascertain whether what we're hearing is accurate or not. So the anti-migrant uh, narrative, which is pushed, for instance, by so much media and so much of politics, is categorically false. There's been no evidence to suggest anywhere that migration is anything but good for growing economies. Now, there are certain challenges when you have open borders and that you have large amounts of cultural diversity and some countries handle it very well and others don't. I don't think Australia has handled it very well. I think there's a lot of tension between different types of cultures within Australia and that hasn't been um, a really uh, great way to integrate cultures or to have people on a difference whilst collectively identifying as Australian. But in some other countries in Canada, for instance, it's been done really well. So um, I think that, you know, we, we have a personal obligation to find out what is factual and to then make decisions based on the change that we want to see. Yeah, and I think I think that's very true. And I think that you know what what we've seen is in recent years the decline of the what would normally be the networks or the newspapers because people are increasingly getting their information online and digitally. They're getting their information. So, and often what they do is they select people or media organizations or online podcasts and so on that fit their own views. And, and that it's interesting in that process because those who do that, who only listen to or, or see things that they agree with, it's like an echo chamber as opposed to making sure that you have a diversity of opinion. So I'm a strong believer in organizations like the British BBC Australian ABC and, and so on that try to have a balance of opinions. Now, it's interesting that traditional media hate that. So you see the BBC here being attacked constantly, people calling on conservative uh, governments to, uh, def to, to reduce their funding, uh, the same as happening in, in Australia. That's dangerous because you'll end up in a situation like America, where when the last time I was in America, which was going off to see Ash and uh, Peter in Durango, I had a night in Dallas at an airport hotel. And I flipped between Fox News and CNN, who were dealing with the same political issue. You might as well have been on a different planet. Like it's, I mean, it would... It was dealing with the same issue, but the if you looked at what the CNN commentators were saying and then what the Fox News commentators were saying, it was like dealing in a completely different country. And so you've got a situation which is quite dangerous, I think, for democracy, where people are saying things, and we've seen this with the President of the United States saying that he won the election. He's even got people from his own party coming out and saying this is just not true. Why is he doing that? Because he knows that he's on those networks that are purely appealing to his base. 
So it's the same in countries. If you see people who seek to divide their populations on ethnicity grounds, or if they seek to divide their populations on religious grounds in order to en enhance their own position, they're usually narrow casting rather than broadcasting to, to their base support to get them agitated. And that's where lies are put into the system to get people angry about someone else. So I think it's a diversion you know, tactic. <laughs> a diversion, a diversion tactic. tactic from what's against really own, going on. Against their own for they're often against their own incompetence. So right. So but in terms of young the question was about sort of young people. I think that again, I think it's really important for people to have to, when they're looking at issues, when they're looking at opportunities, when they're looking at causes, to actually get seek a diversity of opinions because I mean, I'll give you an example. I brought two people into my government from the other side of politics. Hadn't been done for 100, you know, 100 years in, in my state from a, a Labour Premier having people come in. We were much stronger because they brought a regional and rural um, uh, uh, culture and view, viewpoint into the cabinet table that we didn't previously have. So I'm a strong believer in diversity in all of its forms. Now the, the more diverse a cabinet, Jacinda, by the way, has just appointed the most diverse cabinet in the world, I think, with people from LGBT backgrounds, men, women, different ethnicities. It's incredible. And, and you know, they will be stronger for it. The more different voices around the table, the stronger the, 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 the decision-making and leadership will be. Mm -hmm. And that's really at the heart of regenerative design principles too, whether you're designing a team, whether you're designing a project, whether you're designing a program, whether you're designing a business, you take into account your multiplicity of stakeholders, not just the ones that agree with you. And you yeah. learn how to uh, hear through all the different lenses. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Anything um, else? Yeah, yeah. We, we have lots of questions from our young leaders. So I think, uh, Franka, would you like to go next with your question? Okay. Uh, good, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I am Samuel Chuka Korea. Have we lost him? Um, Are there, there? One of the questions, um, youth um, political factor. I, I really want to hear your view. Youth. Youth political participation in leadership. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I'm going to, if I can start on this about youth participation in leadership. One of the things that I, I like, I love telling this particular story, which I think Peter's heard before, but she'll forgive me. When I was in New, I, I was born in London, raised in New Zealand, and went to Australia. Uh, when I was 24, so I have you know all these different passports and nationalities. But when I was in at university, I was part of a group that of 20, 19 and 20 year olds who were really angry because the French government. And please, if you've got people from France tuning in, uh, this was a long time ago. I don't want to offend anybody, but the French government was testing nuclear weapons, you know, nuclear bombs, hydrogen bombs in the Pacific. And they were doing it in international waters. And because of French Polynesia, it was convenient for them to have nearby ports, but they would bring these bombs out, put them beneath the balloon a thousand feet up and, and test, explode these nuclear weapons in the Pacific to test them. This was causing radiation damage uh, throughout the Pacific. It was even getting as far as New Zealand, the you know, strontium-90 and so on. We decided, I mean, it sounds ridiculous in, even for me in retrospect, but the group decided that we would stop the French from testing in the atmosphere, that we would stop them dropping a bomb. And at that stage, France was regarded as a, a major power so what happened is the group sent a small boat with two young women um, and two guys, and they sailed across the Pacific 3,000 miles 
And when they got to the point at near Mirara Atoll, they sat beneath, their, their, when I say sat, the, 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 the boat um, was basically going round and round in circle beneath the, the, the hydrogen bomb, which was attached to um, a balloon, because they, they, on the belief, our belief, that the French would never be able to detonate that bomb because it would cause such massive, one, well, it would kill our friends, uh, they would be vaporised, but um, that the world opinion about what we were doing, which was sort of David and Goliath, the little guy, little guy going after the big superpower. And what happened is that this drove the French crazy. The media of the world's attention went on our little boat um, and we were obeying the law because it was in international waters. And what happened was that they, the French came on board the boat uh, in rubber dinghy with their faces blackened. Uh, Marines came on board, beat up the two guys. And uh, they, one of the women, young women who was about 20, was filming uh, what they were doing. The other was taking pictures. The film, they grabbed hold of the movie camera, threw it overboard. Um, one of the young women, um, Anne-Marie, went and locked herself in the cabin. She'd taken pictures. She then replaced the film in, with a new film in the camera, but hid the, other, the film with the pictures of what had happened on board. They were then, they you know, got into the cabin, they grabbed hold of the camera, they probably threw that over, overboard as well. They were then imprisoned, even imprisoned illegally. Eventually, the French lied and they said, they were rescuing them at sea, that they hadn't rammed them, that they hadn't, uh, uh, they were saving them, uh, that guys were injured uh, at sea, and so they were being taken off to a, to a hospital. It was a whole pack of lies. And when we announced that, in fact, uh, what had happened, because we were getting information backwards, they said that we were liars. The Prime Minister, President of France, said we were liars. Eventually, when people were let out back to their country, a press conference was held and there was all the pictures of the people being be beaten up by guys with blackened faces and smashing people's faces in. This caused massive uh, international damage to the French. Uh, and then the Australian Prime Minister and the New Zealand Prime Minister took the French government to the International Court of Justice at The Hague and France ended up having to stop nuclear, atmospheric nuclear testing in the Pacific. And I keep reminding people that you always hear people say, if people say to you, you know, there's no chance you've got to can do that, you know, it's the cynical attitude, what's the point of trying because you can't succeed, the power structures are against you. No one can stop you if you've got a great and just cause, and you're persistent enough. This was a group of, of really, really young people who decided to take on a superpower and win, and they won. Mm. So my message to people about leadership is at every level. You've got to work at it. It's hard, hard work. You have to take risks. You get, some, you get knocked back. People will attack you. It doesn't matter if the cause is good enough. Leadership, perseverance, commitment uh, will work out in the end. But I think one of the important points of that story, Mike, is they worked within the parameters of the law. They weren't breaking anything legally. Yep. You know, there have been instances early on in the days of Sea Shepherd and of Greenpeace where they were breaking the law and they were ramming boats and doing these types of things. And it was one means with which the international community could invalidate their efforts. So, I mean, if you're working lawfully and you're or like clear about your intention, this is the authentic self peace. you know, you have a really good shot at making a significant difference. And to our friends in India, of course, what we were doing, and this, by the way, was Greenpeace New Zealand, is the boat was called Greenpeace 3, is that you know, it was using Gandhian principles of non-violence. Mm -hmm. There was violence, but it was all one way by the oppressors and you know, we kept stayed with the law, kept with the law, and we ended up with about 80% of New Zealand population behind us. Yeah. 
As we are running short with time, uh, maybe we can take one question uh, from our young leaders, and then uh, Shelly will sum up. And the questions uh, uh, will record the questions, and we'll try to answer it through our social media and try to uh, get back to them. So, uh, Pranka, would you like to uh, go with your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you uh, so much, Komal. Um, and it has been such an honor to be a part of the session. Thank you so much. Uh, for having us, um, Dr. Ash, Peter, uh, His Excellency Mike, thank you so much uh, for having us. And uh, my question, actually, I've been having a hard time framing it, but um, I'll try my best to put it forward in the most clear way possible. Um, so I started heading a foundation at the age of 22 uh, around last year. Um, and as a youth leader myself, uh, I do do a lot of grassroots work where I work with rural communities in India, uh, trying to educate and uh, talk to them about marine conservation and plastic pollution. And I think this question, I would uh, direct it more to Pita. Uh, as a youth leader myself, also a woman, uh, it's not just as, the women's stereotype is one thing that we do face. Uh, another thing that we constantly, that I have come across at least, is the idea that when you're a youth, you constantly look down upon as someone who's inexperienced, doesn't have absolutely. enough knowledge. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I yeah, I remember being like 32, I think, not quite youth, but still young, giving corporate advisory work and being told I didn't know shit from clay. Absolutely. <laughs> I yes. can relate. <laughs> exactly. And um, and along with that, being a woman has its share of uh, hardships. Um, and working with the rural communities, one thing that we try to do is we try to educate the youth. So as a youth myself, there are days where I am down with not knowing whether I believe in what I'm doing, whether uh, even when it comes to things like people constantly telling you that you're not doing the right thing, you're not going in the right direction. And the next thing I have to do is walk in front of a bunch of 30 children and try to inspire them when at that moment I am lacking complete inspiration. Yes. Um, so what sh what should I, not just me, I think all youth leaders out there face this in some point or the other, be it men or women or of any gender. Um, what is the kind of mindset and how should we prepare ourselves when we are trying to inspire fellow youth uh, to be leaders? Okay, this is, this is a great question because I actually have a trick for this. So if you're taking on something really big and, and – you know, you're someone who's marginalized in leadership like women often are, it's natural at time to time to feel hopeless. So what I do is I give myself a time frame. I say, I'm allowed to feel hopeless for one day. And in that day, I might just like stay in bed, not even bother having a shower, be completely depressed and pitiful and just let my feel self feel totally, totally, utterly hopeless. Just let myself feel it, you know, because you don't want to push it away. You don't want to deny it. Sometimes it does feel hopeless, but you put a time frame around it. And then after that one day, after you let yourself have all those feelings, have all those thoughts, you recognize that it's not the truth. They're just feelings and thoughts that come about sometimes because of the difficulty of the scenario. And you let yourself feel it. And then you get up and then you have a shower the next day and you get back out amongst the trenches and keep doing your work. And sometimes I've found that when I allow myself to feel hopeless, when I'm really sinking into it, I have some of my best ideas. It's true because I'm not trying to force anything. I'm not trying to like make myself feel some other way. And it's just like, oh my gosh, I never saw that. That could solve that problem, you know? So I think it's important on the journey. This is the authentic self, right? You've got to let yourself feel. You don't have to be strong all the time. You don't have to be, you know, in your mind, your stereotype of what a leader should look like. You've got to be you. And you're going to have great days. You're going to have crap days. You're going to have days you're an inspirational, powerful leader and everyone wants to speak to you. You're going to have days where you don't feel like getting out of your pajamas. And that's completely okay because that's the journey. So long as you know that everything is temporary, every feeling is temporary, everything will pass through if you allow it. And sometimes when you're open like that, it leads to incredible ideas. So that's my trick. So I would share that because it works for me. If it doesn't work for you, there will be another way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Franca. Uh, Thank you to everyone uh, and 
special thank you to uh, His Excellency Michael and uh, Ms. Peter Milan for answering the questions. And uh, now I will hand over it to Shelly. Over to you, Shelly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so yes, just to briefly sum up. So uh, here are like my key takeaways. Visionary leadership to address issues related to planetary health lies in teamwork, consensus building, and being resilient to setbacks. Then uh, we also saw the uh, example of Jacinda Arden and uh, she uh, and and you know how our uh, speakers you know took us through how she dealt with a very difficult situation in terms of handling uh, COVID and even like uh, the threats to internal security when there was a terrorist attack. And uh, uh, the other key takeaway is when your leaders announce long-term targets, don't let them stop there. Ask for two years and five years target. We need to hold our leaders accountable. Um, the final uh, key takeaway on um, uh, female uh, visionary leadership is that masculinity should not be confused with patriarchy and women can be patriarchal too. Women should not fall into the patriarchy trap by invalidating others. So uh, I think I will end here and the um, uh, entire recording for the session will be available uh, on YouTube. And so you can always you know, come back and, you know, refer to it. And um, I think it's been an, you know, extremely enriching session and uh, we don't have time for more questions, but I do hope we continue to engage with the pop movement and with the World Sustainable Development Forum as both of these are truly and truly multi-generational platforms for engagement. And I'd just like to add Shaylee, if you guys want to share my social media handle with the participants here, if there's any unresolved questions that people are burning to ask, I don't mind you hitting me up on social media and I can answer you there. There's no problem. That's perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a privilege to be involved and look forward to seeing you all in person again sometime soon, we hope. We yes, thanks, Mike. We love hanging out with you, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Thank you so much. Peter and yeah. Mike. So, Bye, uh, Mike. Twitter, Thank Twitter you very handle. much. So, okay. You want me to put the put my Twitter handle on here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's transcendent MC and yeah. at underscore ram. ram. So, uh, I am all of you to please engage with our two speakers through Twitter, and uh, you can please find uh, the uh, their Twitter handles in the chat box. Perfect. Thank you so Thanks much. a lot for having me. Thank Great. you, Peter. Thank you. It's been amazing. And I just wanted to say, you know, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of diversity in this group, um, and and there are a bunch of questions. I'm sure they'll reach out to you. But I wanted to thank you for for these really fantastic messages. And I I know people will be processing these for a while, but as long as they integrate them in their lives, I think you know we'll make the world a better place. And thank you so much. Yeah, and if on your journeys as young leaders you ever have any challenges, just reach out. And I'm always happy to support where I can. That's amazing. Thank you, Peter. Okay, Thank thanks you. a lot, guys. Enjoy the, enjoy the, enjoy the festive, uh, you know, Christmas, Christmas. season. And, yeah, absolutely. And I hope you're all in. For, for those of you who are Hindu who just had your last Diwali for the year, I hope that went really well for you too. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Very, very warm wishes and look forward to speaking to you and seeing you again soon, Peter. Yeah, okay. See you. Happy Been Christmas. Bye. Thank you. Merry okay. Christmas to Happy all. Happy festivities, Thank everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Stay safe. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, Komal. Thank you, Shelly. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Oh, I